Good evening, and thank you for joining our live stream service here tonight at Bible Baptist Church. We hope you had a wonderful afternoon, and we're going to do things a little bit different tonight. We're going to sing the hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And so, I can't see you where you're at, but if you want to go ahead and stand up as we sing the song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, we'll go ahead and sing the first and the third verse of Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ his Lord indeed. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not, it must not suffer loss. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, put on thy royal banner. It must not, it must not suffer loss. And then let's go ahead and sing, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. The Christ who dwells within us is the greatest power we know. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. The Christ who dwells within us is the greatest power we know. He will fight beside us, though the enemy is great. Who can stand against us? He's the captain of our fate. Then we will conquer, never fear. So let the battle rage. He has promised to be near until the end of the age. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. The Christ who dwells within us is the greatest power we know. And if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are more than conquerors because you are on the winning side in Jesus Christ. Let's now go ahead and sing, Be Strong in the Lord. We'll go ahead and sing the first and the second verse of this song. in the Lord and be of good courage your mighty defender is always the same mount up with wings as the eagles ascending victory is sure when you call on his name be strong be strong be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is yours. So put on the armor the Lord has provided, and place your defense in his unfailing care. Trust him, 
for he will be with you in battle, lighting your path to avoid every snare. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is yours. Let's then go ahead and sing Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Psalm 84, 11. And then we'll go ahead and sing, Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? We'll sing all the verses of the psalm as we consider these important questions. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cross, or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease, while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this foul world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the torch and pure the pain. Supported by thy word. And before we're done with the singing this evening, we'll go ahead and finish with 1 Samuel 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth. With all your heart, with all your heart, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth. With all your heart, with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. For consider how great things he hath done for you. For consider how great things had done for you, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. First Samuel 12, 24. Good singing this evening. Thank you for joining the singing with our, with our praises to the Lord. Let's go ahead and take these next few minutes and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you as our great God and creator. We thank you for Jesus who we, through faith in his finished work on the cross, has saved and adopted us into the family of God. We thank you, Lord, for the great God you are, and praise you for your love, grace, and mercy you have bestowed upon us. Lord, we pray for our church family, first of all for our pastors who diligently study your word and to seek to know your will. Please encourage them and bless them as they would serve you in the needs of the congregation. Please meet the needs of each church member at whatever stage of life they find themselves, looking to you for strength, grace, and help to meet the challenges of each day. Lord, we also pray for our missionaries as they strive to present the gospel to those who are lost and as they labor in their local assemblies to teach and encourage believers. We ask that you would meet their needs, 
Protect and strengthen them as they serve you. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless the remainder of the service and that your name would be glorified in all that is said and done. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Welcome back, King's Kids. We're going to start chapter 3 of Madugu. The wordless book was safe under the corner of his blanket on the floor. Madugu covered it again and then sat on it. No, no, he kept saying. Slowly, he reached under and drew out the book. What if I did cut it, he thought. He measured it with his little finger to see how much one-fourth would be. Such a little chunk. He shuddered and, and pushed the book farther back under the blanket. And his hand touched his hunting knife. The knife could cut the book, he knew. It was a very sharp knife. Well, that night, Madugu could hardly sleep. He awoke when it was barely light and sneaked out. He took his book and the knife with him. At a stump of an old tree, Madugu knelt in the long grass. Help me to be willing to divide it, he prayed. In his heart, he knew it was the right thing to do. And all of a sudden, he heard shouts, and he jumped up. His brothers were running towards him, and little Basu tagging behind. Madugu stared at them. He wished they would just go away. But they did not go away. They just sat there, waiting. So Madugu laid his book on the wide stump. The brothers moved against the old stump to watch, watching very closely. Madugu raised his knife, and for a minute he stood there holding it in the air. Then he pressed the sharp blade against the beautiful colors. Slowly, slowly, the book split in two. Good evening. Good to be back uh, preaching once again. I have enjoyed the book of Samuel and am looking forward to preaching through the entire book. It's, uh, it's an exciting book. You see the hand of God. Uh, what I see, uh, even though the dark clouds seem to be billowing in the book of Samuel, I see the hope. I see the hope in a man of God by the name of Samuel. I see the hope of God in the fact that there's a king who will come on the scene, David, and how that God will work through him. We see the humanity of David, uh, and yet God doesn't use angels to do his work. He uses us as human beings, fallen creatures, sinful creatures, cracked creatures, crackpot people, not on crack, but crackpot in our minds and thinkings. And yet when we give ourselves to the Lord, he changes all of that. He changes our lives and makes something glorious of, of that which seems to be worthless and youth, useless. This morning I considered 1 Samuel in chapter 4, and I looked at verses 1 through 5. Tonight I want to consider verses 6 through 10, and uh, I, I just want to recount the points that I made this morning. The, the main point was is the great wrong or the great wrongs that were there when Israel took the Ark of the Covenant into battle. And we find that God was not invited, verses 1 through 3. Uh, there was a war going on. God was a man of war. And God had showed himself powerful in wars before and after as he was invited and as he would lead the nation of Israel. And uh, God was not invited to this battle. And as a result, the nation of Israel was very, very soundly defeated. We need to remember that we need to trust in the Lord at all times. And we're not to lean to our own understanding. And we are to acknowledge him and seek his direction in our lives, as uh, the book of Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says. We find also that God was not invited or he was consulted. And God's not a genie in a bottle. This ark was a fetish. It was wrong for them to have it as a good luck charm. 
Uh, there was nothing, nothing right and nothing good about that. And we also find then this morning the last of the great wrongs. These two men, Hophni and Phinehas, who should have been men of God. They could have been men of God. They had all of the, the right stuff on their behalf. But they were of this world. They wanted the things of this world. They wanted the thinking and the goodness and the, uh, the immorality that would be offered to them. In fact, many times they initiated the immorality that was there, that was of this world instead of of God. And they were wrong in doing so. And that led to the taking of the Ark of the Covenant of God and also leading to the defeat of the nation of Israel. This evening, what I want to consider is not only the great wrong, but then the great fortification, the great fortification in verses 6 through 10. Uh, the Philistines, seeing the Ark of the Covenant coming into battle, they said, we need to, we need to equip ourselves as men. We need to be strong and ready for battle as they recognized or they thought that the God of the Ark of the Covenant was there because they thought that the God was the Ark of the Covenant. Let's read verses 6 through 10, shall we? And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid. And they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there had not been such a thing hitherto. Four. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all of the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit ye yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not the servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought. And Israel was smitten. And they fled every man to his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of, the, of Israel 30,000 footmen. Let's pray. Father, once again, we need your blessing as we would open your word. Give us understanding from this section in this passage, that which you want for us. Give us that understanding that we should have. And Father, we pray that as we look at ourselves in this world, we realize that the enemy, Satan, stirs up mankind to fight against biblical Christianity. And many times when they look at us or the things that we have, they might fear God, but then on the other hand, we might diminish their fear by our trepidation or even our foolishness like the late nation of Israel who took the Ark of the Covenant of God into battle and they shouldn't have. Help us, Father, to consult you, to look to you for wisdom daily. And you've told us if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God and you give it to us. And, and you don't make us feel bad for the lack of having wisdom. So, Father, we need wisdom from this passage of Scripture. Help us to see what is here. May we draw the applications to our lives. We thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. There was a great wrong, and now there's a great fortification the Philistines realized that they needed to be men, they needed to be strong men, and they needed to fight as much and as strong as they possibly could in this next battle that was going on. We find in this passage 
several important truths. And I want you to understand the one word that I use, and that's the word temporarily. And so I'm going to give these points, but the word temporarily stands out. God is temporarily feared by the Philistines, verse number 7. The latter part of it says, woe unto us. And they say, they say woe unto us because the first part of it said the Philistines were afraid. They were afraid. They said God has come into the camp. Nothing like this had ever happened before. This representative relic of God came into the battlefield and it caused them to fear. Israel shouted. They were glad for it. They didn't know what they were doing by bringing the Ark of the Covenant of God in. And as they brought it in, they thought it was going to give them victory when actually it gave them defeat because they were looking to the Ark of the Covenant of God over against looking to the God of the Ark of the Covenant. This was strange. And it was frightening to the Philistines. The Bible says they were afraid. And the word afraid there is a very, very powerful word to which means it makes even the inner uh, part of them quake because of that fear that was there. They were very superstitious people. They trusted in their gods. And when they would go to battle, they trusted that their God would defeat the other nation's God, whether it be the Hebrews or other people around them. And so they fought in light of their gods. And so when they heard that the Ark of the Covenant of God had come into the camp, they feared that away because their minds remembered certain things. You know, it's interesting that in the United States not too long ago, there seemed to be a great fear and respect of God. In fact, the event of 9-11 still looms large in many people's minds and hearts. At that particular time, shortly after that, the leaders called for people to pray. They wanted us to seek God. They desired God's help and guidance. And it seemed as though people were turning to God. The effects of 9-11 faded away and there became a waning away from the need for God and prosperity came and we really don't need God as much as we thought we did. When we come to today and we have the COVID-19 outbreak, instead of the same outcry from the leaders to pray to God and ask for his help and ask for his wisdom and ask for relief from this, there seemed to be a cooling off toward God on many leaders and their attitudes. There was little call for prayer. Yes, there were some, and I'm glad for uh, the president and the vice president and others that may call for us to pray to God, but it seemed as though they were just an echo in the chambers of the world that seemed so silent in calling for God to help. Yet, with this COVID-19 virus outbreak, there are many hearts of the American people and around the world who are greatly afraid. And yet, there doesn't seem to be the same cry to God for help as there was in uh, uh, 9-11. God was temporarily feared by the Philistines in this passage of Scripture, and God was temporarily feared in 9-11, but that fear was short-lived temporarily. I want you to see another temporary, and that is that God is temporarily respected by the Philistines in verse number 8. It says, Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all of the plagues in the wilderness. They remembered that which God had done in the past. 
these things were still in their minds, even though they were hundreds of years ago, it still loomed large in their thinking. They remembered that the nation of Israel came mightily out of the land of Egypt, and that Egypt was sorely defeated by the God of the nation of Israel. And as they remembered that, they knew that Egypt was a powerhouse of a nation at that particular time. And this small little nation of two and a half million people soundly defeated the Egyptians. And the recounting of the plagues that took place And each of those plagues that happened to the nation of Israel was an act of God against the gods of the nation of Egypt. And all of those gods of Egypt were soundly defeated because the God of Israel had defeated them. And here the Philistines remembered that even though it had been hundreds of years before this had taken place. It brought fear in their hearts, but it brought a temporary respect for God at this time. They they wondered, what are we going to do? How are we going to be able to fight against this God? Who could or who would fight against such a God, such a powerful God as this? This was in their minds. And even though they will win this battle... Here, as it speaks about in verse number 10, they will still remember and think about when we come into chapter 5 and chapter 6, this God of the nation of Israel and the power of the God of the nation of Israel. And they will have that temporary fear and that temporary respect, but it's only temporary. We find when we come into verses 9 and 10, there is, God is seemingly is temporarily defeated. And I say seemingly temporary defeated. Uh, God is never defeated. Amen? God's never defeated. The Philistines thought that he was. They thought that they got the best of the God of the nation of Israel but they didn't. They needed to bolster them out of the terror of the battle that they were about to face. Little did they know that the God of the nation of Israel was not going to fight for Israel. He was never invited. He was never consulted for their war. You ever face defeat? I think if you find as you would analyze yourself when you face defeat, that you'll find that that defeat is because you didn't trust in God and you didn't consult God. You realize that when you would do something in your own power and your own energy, that you lacked the wherewithal to gain the victory. But when God goes with us, because we've invited him for his help and his wisdom, his power, his strength, that there is an inner victory in our hearts. And while it may look like the world may win or Satan has the advantage, we know in our hearts we are victors. You see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross... He won the war. There are battles that we face, but he's the victor of the entire war. When he said it is finished, the war was won. We just have to face battles. And when we do so, we don't fight for victory. We fight in victory. The Philistines soundly defeated the nation of Israel with 30,000 men killed in this battle. An awful defeat, a terrible defeat. The God of Israel 
could not be conquered even though they thought so by winning this battle. What can we learn from this passage of Scripture? What can we consider? Well, as the glory of the Lord was going to be departed from them, and it will be identified, as I said in verse number 21, I said that this morning, the word Ichabod speaks of the glory of the Lord departing. And the glory of the Lord departing from the nation of Israel, and the Philistines got the ark. It caused them to take courage and to think that the God of Israel could be defeated because their gods were greater than the God of the nation of Israel. Israel caused the Philistines to have this wrong view of God. Sometimes we as Christians can give the world the wrong view of God by how we live, our attitude, our defeatism, a sour disposition, a woe is me, a sucking our thumbs when things don't go the way we want them to. And when God isn't good to us and we, we show by our, by our attitude that we think that God isn't good. And what we do is we give the enemy the wrong impression of our God. We, uh, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful that we don't give the world and even other Christians a wrong view of our God. Our God is greater than the battles that we face. And many times God uses circumstances in our lives to bring our heads around where we have to face him and recognize we haven't been trusting him. We haven't been leaning upon him. We haven't been going to him. There hasn't been the relationship that we've had with him that there should be. And sometimes God allows us to face battles just to get our heads turned back towards him. For only a little time did the nation of Israel fear or respect God. It was just a short time that they feared. It was just a short time that they thought they had defeated God. We are not weak when we are weak and depend upon God. We are not strong when we feel ourselves strong, when we depend upon ourselves. We are strong when we recognize our weakness and we depend upon God's strength. We're strong when we realize that our strength won't do, our wisdom won't do. And the Apostle Paul understood that, and David of old understood that, and how many times in the Psalms he would cry out to God for God's help. He would recognize his own human condition and his own frailty and his own inabilities, and he would cry out to God. And that's why we find the Psalms so sweet to our hearts. We need to learn from David, but we need to learn from Paul as well. Because Paul recognized when he was weak, he was truly strong. And he recognized that God's grace was sufficient to meet the trial, the battle that was faced. While our enemy Satan uses people who oppose that which is right, that which is biblical, and that which is godly, these people that supposedly oppose us, they may view themselves as strong and powerful because they think that biblical Christianity is weak and powerless. But they don't realize that we who trust God and rely upon God and trust Him for wisdom and recognize our frailty and weakness really have the power of God behind us. And we have the victory because of the Lord Jesus Christ. God would not be mocked in this passage of Scripture, even though it looked like doom, gloom, and darkness and despair there for the nation of Israel. God would not be mocked. God would be the victor. 
And he would show himself victorious in significant ways in chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. And we need to keep that in mind when we look at chapter number 4. Jesus is the great victor. The stories of our life unfold one chapter at a time, and we do not know the last chapter of our lives, but God does. And God will be the victor in our lives because we're victorious through the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. My friend, though, if you've not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and you may try to be victorious, you find that you cannot be. But when you come and you recognize that you cannot do anything about your own sins and you recognize that Jesus Christ died for you personally and you put your faith and trust in him, when you surrender to him in salvation, the victory is won. He saves your soul. He forgives you of sins. He gives you eternal life. And you are on the victory side. Let's pray. Thank you for your word, dear Father. Thank you for this second installment in chapter 4 of Samuel. And Father, I pray that even as we've considered a little bit tonight, I pray that we'll draw applications and we'll ask the Spirit of God to draw applications to our lives so that we might realize that we live in victory because we know Jesus Christ as our Savior who is the great victor. Bless your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.